Um, hello and welcome. My name is Judith Klein. I'm from Auckland University of Technology in New Zealand and I'm in my final semester of a Bachelor of Creative Technologies. I first got into programming for iOS a year ago and that was when I got involved with the AUC. And since then I've been to Last Dev World, Create World and I even got the chance to attend Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference in San Francisco this year. I came to Devil last year all bright-eyed and shiny and so giving a presentation today feels like I've come full circle. So I'm very excited to be up here today. Uh, a lot of this talk is based on what I've learned over the past year. Uh, not just in technical coding skills, but in little tips and tricks and bits of wisdom I've picked up along the way from conferences, the pros at WWDC, uh, people I just meet at conferences, uh, my classmates, and of course, my own pitfalls. The simple mistakes that lead you around in circles for hours on end, hitting your head in frustration. Uh, the topic itself comes from what my studies and my own research have been focused on and the app I'm developing at the moment. And it's my first time giving a presentation like this, so bear with me. What this talk is about, uh, as I said before, I've been programming for iPhone for a year, so by all means I won't get offended if you think you know more than me and want to change sessions. Otherwise, this talk is aimed at a beginner level, so if you're as bright-eyed and shiny as I was last year, welcome. Uh, can I just get a quick idea of what sort of experience people have? Who's brand new beginner at developing for iOS? Oh, that's good. Uh, intermediate? Oh, yeah. Pro expert, I'm looking at you, Louis. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so what this talk isn't about is it isn't a focus in depth guide around implementing MapKit and core location. The next talk in here directly after this is about mastering MapKit, so stick around for that. What this talk is about, rather, is how to give the user context from location-based data and geotag media from an external source. We're going to use it, look at how to use that in your app with a particular focus on passing incoming JSON files. What I will be talking about today is, is why location is important. If you're in here, you're probably interested in location data and making your app location aware. So you probably don't need too much convincing, but I'm going to talk briefly what, about why I'm interested in location data and what it means meant for me in my projects. Yeah. Uh, the other basics of making your app location aware, that is finding your user uh, who will essentially be the locus of your app, uh, where to get location data from, and as I said, we'll be looking at a very simple example of passing a web-based JSON data to get information into our app, uh, utilizing geotag media, these are things like photos, videos, and tweets, which can be accessed using API calls and JSON feeds, and how to put these in your app. Uh, location on the go. Finally, we'll just look at the cost of being mobile and a few things to remember when you're working with location and mobile data and also take a moment to look at the bigger picture of location awareness and where it's going. All the resources I use in this presentation and sample codes will be available online so don't worry too much about trying to keep up with any demos. I'll give you a link for that at the end of the presentation. First, a bit about me and why I'm here. My first iOS project was looking at creating a pilot application for the Auckland City Art Gallery, which was meant to be an interactive audio tour guide. It was a team of five people, and we were all learning the platform from scratch, uh, the platform and the language, and we managed to develop a functional proof of concept. One well, of the many challenges we faced was looking at how to present a navigation aspect of navigation aspect, and we wanted to create something that was able to sense and respond to the user location, which was difficult when you're dealing with an indoor environment. Uh, we want to present relevant information about maybe what artwork the user was looking at and how all the artworks in the space interacted with each other within the space and the meanings, and adding context to that gallery situation. And it was here I became interested in looking at how these new and emerging technologies were impacting on so many aspects of our everyday lives and even those very traditional spaces, such as a gallery or a museum. Uh, it was this idea of a smart device that was aware of its physical surroundings and then able to create a different way of interacting with it. By embedding spaces with digital data, 
we can utilize the inherent net power of location awareness. Location has become a big part of how we interact with digital data. Many apps you now launch and you see this. Even though the reason an app is, an app is prompting you for your location might not be immediately apparent, what it is trying to say is that by knowing your physical location, it will have an effect on what information is presented to you, and it will at some point affect your interaction with it. What do we mean when we talk about location? There are several ways we have come to understand location and what it means. The most obvious one being the point on a map. We typically think of physical location, the literal geographic context you are in and the section of the world you're occupying. Then there's been the more regioned emergence of the context, concept of a digital space. And this has brought about a more ambiguous sense of location, where you can communicate with people in remote places, work in collaboration with people you might never meet, or even experience places you might never be able to travel to. And let's face it, down here in this part of the world, we're pretty isolated from anything and anyone. These interactions are unhindered by the limits of where we are situated in the physical space and the concept of distance becomes negligible. But how does the iPhone understand location? The device deals with location in terms of coordinates, defined in latitude, longitude, and altitude. This location can be defined by external data source, hard-coded into the app, or from the device's inbuilt GPS. We'll look at this a bit later on. Coordinates don't mean too much to us, so often we are shown a graphical representation for a map. And these are fantastically useful for looking up with other physical locations, getting directions, or getting a sense of distance. But why is location so important? Location is powerful because it provides context. A device such as an iPhone is inherently mobile. The wireless networked enabled, network enabled device is designed to be used on the go in many different places and locations. The modern man moves around a lot more than he used to. But wherever he goes, he can tap into the world wide web. The ability to draw, to draw data from a wider network means that your app can respond to changing user location on the fly. Location is defined by context. Location is powerful because it provides context. The device, such as an iPhone, uh, location is no longer defined merely by your position on a map, but rather it is defined in context by what is around you. So when physical and digital location come together, it begins to look a bit, a bit like that. Things which exist in the digital world can be geotagged and given some real reference to where they exist in that physical space around us. Again, we'll look at what this means a bit later on. Giving your app the ability to respond to location enhances the user experience because it brings them into a familiar context. Many apps are taking advantage of this and creating different ways of interacting with local data and places, many places for many different purposes. Navigation, social, business, and productivity are all common applications. By knowing your location, an app can show you what businesses and bars, restaurants nearby, uh, give you real-time weather and traffic updates that might directly impact on your travel plans and it looks like a typical Auckland day. Um, share with your friends where you are or the general people around you to, to facilitate social interactions. Uh, categorize your media by your photos, videos, even notes by where you created them. Or purely just lump everything together. Uh, this is Wikitude. It's like It just shows you what's been geotagged around you. What all these applications have in common is that rather than the user having to manually enter their location or search for relevant data, it's automatically presented to them. The app can automatically determine where they are and present what it thinks is most likely to be of interest to the user. By incorporating geographic data into your applications, you can orient the user to their surrounding environment. Location services is all about mobility and the fact that your application is running on a device that can go anywhere. Knowing the user's geographic location can help you improve the quality of the information you offer and in some cases might even be at the heart of your application. So we can see location is more than simply navigation. Now that we understand what location is and are excited about what it can do for our app, let's look at how we can get it into our app. 
Map and location related applications rely on two frameworks, core location and map kit. Core location provides the ability to determine where you are in the world geographically and involves using GPS, where map kit enables interaction with maps, funnily enough, uh, using Google Maps. Though the two frameworks do tend to go hand in hand, integrating location awareness doesn't necessarily mean integrating MapKit. I'm going to focus more on core location and again, if you're interested on a more in-depth guide to core location MapKit, stick around for mastering MapKit straight after this. So how do we do this? And I'm going to do a quick brief demo, uh, which will look at pretty much find, getting location and how to get it to spit out the value that we can use later. So we start by creating a view-based application and calling it Find Me. Is that coming up right? Yep. So we can create that. The most important thing here is to remember to add the framework. You will hit a lot of brick walls if you forget to import the framework because they'll have no idea what you're talking about. So we link it with core location. And then we go over to we go over to our app to our app delegate. It's different seeing it in such big text. <laughs> and we need to remember to no, sorry, not our delegate. We go into our Find Me View Controller, hit a file, and we need to import our core location. Uh, we want our view control class to conform to the CL location manager delegate method so it can receive information on the from the location manager so we can add this to our interface. And the main class for core location is the CL location manager. So we start by creating a pointer to hold the instance of the core location we create. Oh, I speed it does that on Mac with you now. From my experience at previous conferences. I've seen so many demos go wrong, so I do have a, here's one I prepared earlier, lined up. I've never done a live coding demo before. And then just finally, we need to add the property for that as well. All the pros here can feel free to call me up on any bad coding I'm doing. So next, the location manager will call delegate methods when location information becomes available or changes. So next we're going to create a pointer, CL location manager pointer, which is going to be set to receive the first update from the location manager. So that's going to be our starting point. So we're going to create a location. And it's going to be starting. Point. Just to get an idea, who's worked with core location before? Yep, the people who've done coding before. Cool. And again, just our property. So that's what we need to do here. So we can go over to our. Oh, yep. Thank you. 
<laughs> cool, so we go over to uh, findmeviewcontroller.m file and synthesize these and again need to remember to import our framework. Unfortunately, I do speak from experience when I say it gets very difficult if you forget to import a framework. You learn these things. Although it's pretty good at warning you now when you've made silly mistakes. It's very good at reminding you if you've got a semicolon. And then we synthesize. It does. It is. There we go. And our starting point and our latitude. Latitude? Not sure what that is. No, we're not synthesizing that. Uh, so for the next part, because we're just testing using a simulator, it won't be able to determine our location. Uh, Apple automatically, in this current version of Xcode and in the past versions, it just automatically points you to Apple HQ in Cupertino, one infinite loop. And there's actually, I found a bit of a bug with 4.1 and Lion where it actually can't determine your location. It gives you a nice error message. And so they're just going to put in a bit of a workaround that, and because we're not getting any real location out of it anyway until we test on the device, we'll just be able to put in something to hard code it in for now. So we're going to put this in just after our import, but before the implementation. And so we're going to create a temporary hack. Location fix. Get rid of that. So we're going to create a location. Just going to call it location. And we're gonna, it's going to equal, oh, we're going to allocate that. Allocate it, and we're just going to initiate it with a latitude. So we're going to put that in there. I would just say 42. I have no idea where that is. Probably nowhere near here. And longitude. And I'll just say negative 50. Oops, and I'm dropping my iPad. What doesn't matter? <laughs> and set the delegate. Self and did update nope. location. And so we're going to put in our location and from location. No. Nope. Right. Open bracket is. Up 
to where? After the equals. Put another square bracket there. Oh, yeah. There we are. Oh, and that's already in there. No. Anyway, I'm very slow at typing, so we're going to go to our, here's the one I prepared earlier, because otherwise we will be here all day. <coughs> so, ta-da, I've written lots of code. So there's the workaround. So there's the workaround um, update, and then it starts updating our location. In the view did load, we allocate and initialize a CL, loc CL location manager instance. Then we assign our controller class as the delegate. Uh, next, we set the desired ac accuracy to the best available, and we'll look at what this means later. And finally, we tell our location manager to start updating our location. Uh, core location is event-based, and essentially what is happening here is that an update event will be triggered when core location is running and a new location becomes available. We can also set a distance, distance filter to specify how far the device must move before it notifies us of any change. The default value <coughs> is none, but I've put it in anywhere, anyway. To go down. And and so now we can start the location manager and start polling for location. And since this class is designated itself as the location manager's delegate, we know that the location updates will come to, into this class if we implement the delegate method, uh, which is what we do here. And the first thing we do is we check whether the starting point is nil and assign the current location as the starting point. So if the starting point is nil, then we have a assign it as our new location. And then when the location object is received, it is handled by the CL location manager. And it's and so we're going to create and allocate some strings to format these values and pass them into some other strings. So we've created a latitude string and a longitude string. So we format it to have the little nice degree symbol. And finally we'll just print out these values so we can check it's all working. Oh, that's a big iPhone. Has it found our location? There we go. So the longitude is negative 50 degrees, and the latitude is 42. And so now that we're done with these values, and we have our location, we need to remember to be good memory management citizens and release anything we've allocated or copied, or uh, anything we've created. If you create it, you have to release it. And then finally, we just also need to create an error method to let the user know if their location can be found, uh, so the app doesn't just sit there and the user doesn't know what's going on because they'll create a bad experience for them. And finally, we can just release our location manager as well. Where are we? There we are. We are in our demo. So, so far we've looked at why location is important and how to get the device to find its location. So for this next part, we'll take a look at the technologies the device uses to determine its location, which will give you a better understanding of the code we just looked at and how to optimize that code. So it's all good and well knowing where we know. So it's all good and well locating your user, but we need to give them some of that really interesting context of what's around them. And so we'll look at where you can get the, some of the information data from. First and most obvious, as we just looked at, location comes from the device itself. And to find where the device is located, it uses three different positioning methods. First, it could use the cellular, the inbuilt cell radio. The device gets the location based on what cell tower it's connected to. The second is Wi-Fi, which is similar to cellular. It scans to see which access points are nearby. 
and then is able to pull the unique identifier to determine its location. And finally, a GPS receiver, which listens for satellites around Earth and triangulates the device's position. When you're writing your app, you aren't able to specify which of these methods you want to use. But when you ask for a location, you can customize what type of location you want back. Setting the desired accuracy determines which method it will use, as they each come at different costs. In the demo before, we looked at location accuracy best, but you also have several other options. It cannot be stressed enough. Use only the level of accuracy you require. Location services puts a huge drain on the battery, especially if you're requesting a high level of accuracy. If you only need to know the city your user is in, uh, you don't need to request a very high level of accuracy, and you'll only need to request it once, as it's unlikely to change, unless you're writing an app that expects the user to be doing a road trip and moving through different cities. Drive through New Zealand, and you drive through some towns that take a couple of seconds to drive through, so maybe you'll want to know what these towns you drove through are. Requesting a low level of accuracy will probably just use the cellular data method as the quickest and most inexpensive form of positioning. The device already knows which cell tower it's connected to, and then it just needs to look it up in a database to get a location. It's only, only accurate to, to about 500 meters, and cell towers can be up to several kilometers apart. The Wi-Fi method gives a bit more accurate results as the Wi-Fi access points are closer together. It's a bit more power, incentive, uh, power expensive as it needs to perform a scan of the nearby points, uh, but it's still reasonably fast. Once it's found nearby access points, again, it just needs to check it against the database. And the third method, GPS, is probably what we most commonly associate with location. And that's where the phone's inbuilt GPS receiver listens for the satellites around the Earth to triangulate the position of the device. It gives the greatest degree of accuracy, but is the most power intensive, and you need a direct path to the sky. Uh, as I said, there's no guarantee you'll get the ac oh, there's no guarantee you'll get the accuracy you require you request, and that just comes from the inherent nature of mobility and technology. People like to take their devices anywhere and everywhere. And, to more and more remote locations might not have some or any of these technologies available. Your app needs to be able to handle situations where it cannot determine location. Also keep in mind how often you request information about change in location. Setting up the distance filter enables you to specify the minimum distance the device must move laterally before it informs you of any change. The default is none and that just notifies you of all movement, and which again is expensive in terms of power. Okay, so now we know where we are, which is good, uh, but that's not very interesting. We want to know what some of that context is. We looked at this diagram before, and so we need to, we want to look at how to add, put some of that into our app. Geotagging is the process of adding geographical information, identification metadata into various media. And more and more media that's being uploaded to the internet is being embedded with location data. Photographs, videos, tweets, social media. I hope you're all tweeting from Preston, although I don't know whether that's a good thing. And, and the metadata, again, alone by itself, isn't particularly interesting. The simple latitude and longitude values don't mean to us much to us as humans. It's all numbers. Uh, so we start importing this data into our apps, and we start using them in interesting ways that we can make something really fun with it. I combine with the user's location, and immediately you have the power to give them context. Keep in mind that geotagging is not to be confused with geocoding. When we talk about geocoding in terms of programming, it refers to the process of converting place name into latitude and longitude coordinates. And reverse geocoding is the process of committing coordinate values to something more meaningful, such as a graphical place mark on a map. An uh, example we'll look at later will take the user's location and find photographs from Flickr that are nearby. And there are also many existing resources that can give you some of this contextual information. In New Zealand, we have Zendu, which is an open source database that provides information about local businesses through a search engine based on location awareness. So how do we get some of this amazing fountain of geotagged media into our app? 
One of the most useful ways uh, that I found really easy to use is through a JSON feed. Uh, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation and is a way of communicating data over the internet and an o a text-based open standard. It is often used as an alternative to XML for transmitting structured data over a network connection and is really simple to use in an iPhone app for two reasons, two main reasons. Uh, the raw JSON feed itself is human readable, so you can get an understanding of how the data is structured, and it's also really easy to read in your application. Once you've passed the incoming information, you can store the values in dictionaries and arrays for easy access. What's the catch? Because you're dealing with media on the internet, your app needs to be able to get the data off the internet. So for this next example, we're going to look again at a very <coughs> simple demo that gets a JSON feed off the internet and puts the data into a useful format like a table view. Uh, I'm going to go straight to my here's one I prepared earlier. There we are. So for the second demo, I've got a simple JSON feed that contains some data about some one-day deals. You know, those things you don't remember signing up for but turn up in your email inbox every morning, uh, tempting you to part with your hard-earned cash. What we want to do is we want to access the URL, pass the contents of the feed using a JSON framework, and put it into a dictionary. From this dictionary, we can create an array of values from the feed that are of interest to us. So let's start by looking at the feed we're going to be importing into our app. There we go. It's not particularly, again, not particularly interesting. Uh, this one is one I've created myself in PHP, and all it is is a bunch of nested arrays. And there's the main array containing all the deals, and each deal itself is a nested array containing useful information like the name of the deal, the vendor, the price, and the one we're interested in particular is location. So once we've got this data in a useful format, can present it in a table view so the user can, user can browse what's happening. I've got a navigation, oh yeah, no, that's for the demo. Uh, the first thing that I need to remember is again to import the JSON library. Yeah, that's the wrong demo. There we are, demo two. That's much better. So we need to remember to import our JSON. No, that's still the wrong demo. Here we are. So first thing we need to remember, import the JSON. Otherwise, it will complain when you try call its methods. And, and it doesn't, I'm using Xcode 4.1, the, the current official release of Xcode, because it doesn't, the JSON library doesn't like to play nice with the Xcode 4.2 yet, which I've had problems with. And so in the root view control, we've just created a few arrays to hold some of our values. And in the root view controller, we import the JSON feed, which is just hosted on my website, on my server. And we format, we just allocate the string, and which is an NS URL, and then check that it's returning, and put it all into a dictionary. In the view to load method, we create a string to, yep, we've created the string. And when you're working with getting data off the internet, it's good practice to check that the connection hacks has succeeded, and if not, to return an error message, but we're just going to leave it like this for now. Uh, when we, so we've created our dictionary of called of results, and we're just going to use a string that we created, we, and it's holding the URL. Already we could test an NS log and see what value is coming out of it, and that would spit out the formatted JSON that we looked at in the browser. Uh, but we're going to drill down into our dictionary and get the value for the deals, get the deals and the name of the deal, and the vendor, and the address. And for, for this demo, we're just looking at getting the literal string address uh, rather than latitude and longitude. Uh, and Put this in a friendly label which we can read. If you wanted, you could even geocode to get the coordinates. Uh, and finally, we go down to set up our table. We go down to set up our table and we just count the number of deals we have in our array, and that's how many rows we'll have in our section. 
And then when we go to set up our cell, we set, create a text label which has the deal, name of the deal and a subtitle which has the name of the vendor. And that's all we need to do in the view to load. Oh, and yeah, it's all we do to set up our table. And then we also just need to, the default for the table is default, but which needs to be updated to subtitle in order to actually display that subtitle. So if we build and run this now, we can see that it we can see that it loads all those deals into a nice table. The internet probably doesn't like it. And this is why you check your internet connection. There we go. So it has all our deals and all our vendors. So next we want to drill down a bit further to get the name of our to get the address. So we don't go down into our did select row at index, at index path and we get the name of the location which goes into, so it can get what value of the array the deal the user has selected and there'll be the same value for the array that has stored the locations and then it just pushes that onto our detail view controller, it passes onto detail view controller and pushes our detail view controller onto the stack which then receives it and sets it as a location name and then sets it as a text label and we release our location name. So then you see if we click on that we get our nice venue. Fantastic. But you, oh, you need to remember to set up your nib file as well. So there's a nice label and that's just set up to receive that information. So, it's, so that label is hooked up to location label. But we can see that's working. So now that we've got that information from the server, it, we can use it into our app in many ways. But that's not very interesting because it's static information. What else can we do? Uh, who uses Flickr? Yep, few people. In a previous life, before I got into programming, I was set out to become a photographer, but I decided I didn't want to become a starving artist, opting instead to come to developer conferences and get lots of, fed lots of food in between coding. I still enjoy my photography, and I like geotagging my photos, and many other people do too. We can take advantage of these to explore more about the area around us, or maybe a place you intend to visit, see what neighborhood is nice to live in, see what area you want to stay at a hotel, and so we can put these in our app as well. If you're interested in working media in your apps such as Flickr and Twitter, many of these sites offer APIs for developers to integrate the media into their apps. We're going to take advantage of some of these and get some photos in our app. This is going to be a little more complex than, our previ than the previous demo because there are dozens of different methods for getting exactly the right type of data that you need and it can spit it out in several different formats including JSON. So we go back to the web and you can see that there's, for the Flickr one, there's dozens and dozens of methods you can call. The one we're interested in is flickr.photos.search and we can see there's one here that says has geo, so we want that. But there is a warning in the documentation that if the, the geo requires geo queries require some sort of limiting agent in order to prevent the database from crying. Mm -hmm. So we don't want the database to cry. So we'll put in uh, we'll just specify it for date for photos update uploaded in 2011. And then we're interested in finding it around a particular point. So we're just going to put in a latitude and a longitude value. There we go. Those are some good numbers. And we'll put in about a 10 kilometer radius. And we'll say just load 20 per page. And then we can output it as a JSON. And in most APIs, you need to have an API key to use it. And so I'm calling as under my API key. So I call the method and it spits out a bunch of photos that are geotagged. And we can see the URL there, and that's what we want to put into our app. So if we go back to Xcode, so there we are. So we want um, to 
with our Flickr in our table. We're going to display these in the table. So it's very similar to the one we created before. Um, so we format our string. So there's a string that's flat out before, but we can format it. So rather than hard coding our API key and our latitude values in, we can just format it so we can change it on the go. And if you have a location coming out of the GPS, here again I've just hard coded the location in, but you can substitute that with a value coming out of the GPS. And so that puts it all into the format, um, then calls it. And so it's the same method we looked at before. All we've done is just formatted the string slightly differently. And then it's a bit different to put the values into our dictionary. Oh, it's the same to put in the dictionary. And then we go to put into the arrays. We just need to check that the, a lot of people leave their photos untitled. So we need to check if it's untitled. And if it is, we just create, name it instead, untitled. And then we need to get the photo IDs. And we'll see why in a minute. And then again, everything's exactly the same. We count the number of photos in our array to create the number of rows in our table. And then we pass. Then when the user selects a photo, it gets the it goes into our photo ID array and gets the ID of the photo and it pushes it through to our sends it through to our detail view controller. And so that receives that. And then here it gets slightly different because then we call another, we have to call another a API method. Uh, this time we're looking at, we're interested in flickr.photos geo get location. So here it calls a single, you get a single photo, so we'll say we'll get that one. So it's only asking for single arguments, so we put that in, call it in JSON. And so it's a single photo and it's telling us a lot of information, like the latitude, longitude is what we're interested in. Uh, we can see that's similar to our original values, so we know it's nearby. And I know that the value I put in was from Auckland, and we can see clearly this photo is from Auckland City as well, so we're on the right track. So we're calling our flickr.photos.geo get location, and we're passing in our photo ID, and we're passing in our API key again as well. So we, call, we create an NS URL with our formatted URL string. Uh, we create a dictionary from our results. This is all the same. And then we get our location value, format it, and then we put that one. And then when we run that, again, we've got label, which is hooked up to set up to receive that information. And when the internet wants to load it, searching through all the photos and the database is having a cry, and that's not the right one. That's what we wanted. And these are the issues you'll have to deal with when you're working with network as well, is for slow connections. There we, there we go. We can see we have Auckland Art Gallery. That sounds like we're in the right location. Uh, Wellesley Street Library. That all sounds nearby. So we can click on one of these, and it spits out the latitude and the longitude value. So now for the final part of the presentation, find where we are again. So it works. But what's wrong with this code? Well, a lot. For starters, it doesn't do anything particularly interesting. That would never get accepted into the App Store. Currently, it's only spitting out a coordinate value. And what I'm trying to show you, but what I'm trying to show you is how to get the data. And once you have it, you can do anything you want with it. As with the second demo, if you can even get an address, you can use that lo within location-aware context by geocoding. There are many ways to use location data, and once you get that data, the possibilities are endless. Once you know how to use one API, it's not going to be too hard to adapt to others, such as Twitter. But Twitter, if Twitter and Flickr don't excite you too much, I don't blame you. We're getting past the playful days of social media. Well, sort of. If you start looking at the bigger picture, we started to get into 
more serious business and serious applications. Immersive and augmented realities are when we can actually begin to abstract away from the concepts of physical, literal, or real world locations. By knowing the user's location, orientation, and heading, you can manipulate their perception of reality or what's in that space by overlaying it with an alternative or an augmented view. By geofencing, we can set up a virtual perimeter around the location that can push notifications to mobile devices when they are physically nearby. Whether it's a business pushing out a deal, a parent notified of a wayward child uh, leaving a designated area, or detection of a stolen car, the location-aware device is responding to its context, and this has huge implications for our personal, social, and personal interactions. This can also get into things like home automation, that fantasy that all your network devices will be able to tell where you are and respond to your location, and then when you're on the way home from work and make you a cup of coffee and cook some dinner and start heating up your house. It'll no longer be about the smart device, but rather the networked smart devices and the internet of things. And this can all come from the core skills I've looked at today. It's knowing where your user is and knowing the context of what's around them and how to respond to it. Once you've got those, it is up to you how to use it and how you respond to it. But let's get it back to what else is wrong with this code. It's not very well structured. I lumped a lot into the view did load methods. But what I, mo I mostly did there so you could see what was happening without having to jump between classes a lot. As your code gets bigger and you need to have a clear structure, and it often helps to divide your classes up into model, view, and controller folders. This will save you a lot of headaches from trying to fix bugs. And finally, the memory is pretty poorly managed. Uh, I'll be honest, since I was working with Xcode 4.2 for a while, which introduces the automatic, automatic retain counter, and it makes memory management a million times easier. And, and hence, it made me quite lazy. Uh, so pretty much everything I showed you, do as I say, not as I do. Uh, as you're starting out, you're probably going to end up with a big folder of bits of code you tried out and downloaded from here and didn't work on whatever version of Xcode you're running. And ones that just seemed easy enough. So you're going to have a lot of bits of code. But as you start expanding your code into a fully functional, polished, and refined app, I cannot stress the importance of a clean structure and careful memory management, as I'll save you lots of time later on. Even though this, the code I showed you does seem to work, if you tried to run it on a device, it probably wouldn't work. And this brings me to the final section of my, code, of my talk. As I'm nearing the end, I'll pass on some key ideas and pieces of wisdom, wisdom to take away, if nothing else. People use devices, not simulators. Probably one of the most important things to remember is that while the location simulator is fantastic, you need to test your apps in the real world. The simulator is quite good at lulling you into a false sense of security that everything's functioning perfectly. It seems quite obvious to say it, but test your app on a device. Test it on older devices, newer devices, and keep in mind that not all devices will support some of the new hardware features, some of the hardware features. The best way to find bugs is by testing and testing on the device and taking it to lots of different locations and using it as you would expect your users to use it. You don't want your users to find your bugs. Mobility is the exception, not the norm. There's so much more we're able to do by taking advantage of tapping into the wider network, being mobile networked. And networking has become part of the human experience. Now iPhone has fundamentally changed how we interact with that network. Uh, we now often feel lost and alone and sad if we're disconnected from it. Even, and so even if you have carefully written and tested your app, you have to be able to account for issues that are out of your control. Creating a location where app can be a double-edged sword if you're having to rely on internet connection or being able to get the user's location. You need to be able to handle situations where there's limited connectivity or none whatsoever. Never assume anything about the user's location or internet connection. Network configuration is completely dynamic and can be assumed to change at any time for any reason, especially if your user is on the move. Don't assume network is free and power definitely isn't free, so use both wisely. Handle your errors gracefully uh, when errors do occur. Uh, consider having an offline mode or using cached content. Hide problems from the user if possible so they can still interact with the application. If this isn't possible, make sure they know it's a network that's slow and not your app. 
The reality of networking is that connections will go down, packets will get dropped, timeouts will occur. Put the user in control, not all users will enable location services. When prompting them to enable for the first time, make sure they understand the consequences of their decision, of what features will and won't be available, and even especially if the reason you're wanting their location isn't immediately apparent. Even when the user does enable location services, you still might not be able to get the location. GPS can't be used indoors, and older devices don't have the GPS receiver. You need to be able to handle times that if you won't get a location. Give an error message, let the user know, and offer an alternative. Enable them to still interact with your device. Portability means batteries, and part of the user experience is that they expect the device to last them all day. GPS drains the battery. When I started on iOS programming, they let, the university lent me an iPhone 3G, which I'm still using, next release. Uh, getting directions to go from point A to B, the battery will be completely run down by the time I get to B. Uh, choose your location accuracy and the distance filter wisely. Think very carefully and choose the right methods for your, for your use case. With the new release of Xcode 4.2, or if you've been working with the beta, you can simulate location, and this is incredibly useful as before when you're testing your locations, it just showed you Apple headquarters, the location for one infinite loop. Uh, and this, should, again, shouldn't replace real-world testing, um, but we'll be able to give you an idea of how your app would behave in locations you won't be able to visit. And Will's probably going to kill me for putting that picture in. Another important thing, it might be slightly redundant, don't forget to import the framework, don't forget to import your libraries. When you start out encoding, you will make lots of mistakes, I'm not going to lie to you. I unfortunately, uh, I, I, as I say, I speak from experience, when forgetting to import a framework, you get lots of errors. Uh, some days your code won't work, it'll look like you've done everything right and it'll keep crashing. Go away, have a cup of coffee, have a walk. Um, you can go and look at some tutorials, the documentation, find a different way of doing the same thing and might find a better way or you'll see where you went wrong. Do something different. Matthew's pretty boring. Uh, it's very useful and functional, but there are a lot of apps that just show maps in the same way. Think of how you can present your information on the map in a way that is new and different. There are so many ways to effectively utilize location awareness and it doesn't always mean having to use a map. Make your apps magical. Apple frequently uses magic in their advertisements, and it was a line they brought up a lot at WWDC in the presentations. You do all the hard coding work and the technical coding stuff, as, the, as Josh was saying this morning as well, you need to hide all that from the user. It becomes invisible to them. What it is about is what your app enables them to do and how it makes them feel when they're doing it. Finally, have fun, be passionate. There's a video with Steve Jobs where he says, you have, to lot, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. If you're not having fun doing it and you don't really love it, you're going to give up. And that's what happens to most people. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Um, all the resources from the presentation, including the sample codes and links to some helpful tutorials that have helped me a lot um, along the way. And... Don't forget to stick around if you want some more accurate information about MapKit and core location for the next talk. And I just want to finish off by saying that some of the best opportunities of my education have been in the past year, since I've been involved with iOS programming and the AUC. It's a great bunch of people. Bring your friends. I've brought some more people from my degree this year. And if you enjoy Devil this year, why not give a talk up here next year? I can do it. You can do it. And I hope you've enjoyed it, and whether you did or didn't, feel free to come up and have a chat to me, what I did wrong, what I did right, if I made any horrible blunders, or told you any lies. I um, hope to meet a lot of you and enjoy the rest of the conference.